Well, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Paula Duran, and I need to um, uncover our picture. I'm Dr. Paula Duran, and I'm the director of Universal Dementia Caregivers. And every Thursday, we come to you with some conversation related to caregiving. Uh, we've had a variety of conversations up to this point, but today our guest is Tamara Parent, and she's been with us before. She's the coordinator at the Detroit Area Agency on Aging in the area of abu abuse, elder abuse prevention. And so she was with us once before and we talked about, um, in general, about abuse and neglect. Today we wanna talk about financials and what that looks like. And so let me first say welcome to Tamara, to back to our, our gathering today. Oh, thank you, I'm glad to have, thank you for having me. Great, um, this is a very important topic, especially when we start thinking about the pandemic and the issues that people are facing right now. Uh, it's really important because when we think about adults and those we're caring for, Right now, if the statistics say 55 million people are serving as unpaid caregivers. And with that 55 million people, unpaid first of all, many of them have not been formally trained. We're, we're excited when they have gone to some of the trainings that we, we offer as well as the Detroit Area Agency. Um, it's important that we know that most of them are women. Uh, most of them are uh, probably, they said many of them are still trying to work, and it's interesting also that many of them take the role out of love, but some take it out of obligation because no one else would do it. So we want to talk about some of the responsibilities of those caregivers, and it's a lot of work. We all know that caregiving can be a very stressful job, a 24-7 job where you have to coordinate care, you have to court manage the finances, make sure the house is right ensure that they get to medical kind of situations. But please know there's lots and lots of things to do. And we wanna spend some time today talking about some of the financial roles that caregivers serve for a loved one, uh, an, an, an older adult. And it, there's cognitive issues that makes this even, even more or as important as we move forward. So mm -hmm. I wanna just start with uh, Tamara. Let me just ask the question in, in welcoming you. Um, this whole conversation about financial exploitation or fiduciaries. I labeled it on, on, on the screen. I labeled it, I have to handle dad's money. And, but it's more than money, it's the assets too. Can you tell me very briefly, why is this an important topic? This is an important topic because a lot of times people in their role of being caregivers and trying to handle their, their uh, parents' money or whoever it is that they're caregiving for, uh, they cross the line and they begin to commingle funds or they do not uh, include them in the conversation of how they're spending the funds. And uh, based on their uh, lifestyle or let's say whatever habits, then the seniors money is being, being depleted and uh, they're, being, uh, they're not meeting the needs for this senior uh, person. So therefore, uh, they're crossing over into the lines of financial exploitation and abuse. And sometimes they make decisions that um, are premature, trying to get them to sign over financial documents like the deed to the house, et cetera, rather than uh, setting things up in a, in a course so that they're not intimidating uh, the senior or person that they're taking care of. And this makes that uh, them vulnerable as well as a senior vulnerable for them financial exploitation. So, so let me let really me stop you. Let me stop you there, and and say that many of our caregivers have not been even made aware of what the lines are in terms of financial responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, because many of our caregivers are signing checks for for the person they're serving, and they're not on the account, but bills right. have to get paid. And to my understanding, that's not quote unquote legal, uh, but it's necessary sometimes. So it why is. don't you start step backwards and help me and help me and help the caregivers understand what are some of the financial things? Uh, because you said commingling, we understand that. Not everybody will understand that. Tell us what's the role of a caregiver when it comes to financial support of a loved one. Well, when it comes to the financial support of a loved one, it means that, uh, as you say, you, you need to do things, you're doing them out of love, but yet and still 
they have to be aware of the legal ramifications and putting things in place. If the person has capacity, they need to go to the bank or the credit union and have their name put on the signature card. They need to become, uh, say, the power of attorney or giving authorization to uh, write those checks and, and then to sign the checks. Uh, because sometimes, say, if, if it comes back in a negative way, it means that they're going to be prosecuted. And basically what it was is financial illiteracy, that they didn't know that these things need to be put in place. So there needs to be a lot of education on the financial literacy of being a caregiver. Even as far as speaking for the person, sometimes when people have lost capacity or have mild stages of dementia, they may not recall certain things. So even when you're trying to pay the utilities, you have a conflict in the billing or anything like that, you have to speak for that person. Uh, these are things that need to be put in place so that the caregiver knows uh, in their role of trying to be the fiduciary, meaning the trusted person that's handling their finances and expenses, uh, that these organizations know that this is who that person is and that, that they have permission to do this. Okay, then let me ask a bit. Let's get real specific for folks. Right now, there is no documentation. I'm a caregiver. There is no documentation, but I also know I want to stay out of court because if the courts get involved, the courts have a hefty fee that they charge if they become conservative. And we'll talk about those things. But right now, my loved one still has capacity, mental capacity for conversation and assign things. What things should I start talking to my loved one about and what documents should I get in place? So the first thing should be the power of attorney. And then uh, the next thing should be- Let's, Let me stop you. What is a power of attorney? Okay, the power of attorney is the person giving you their consent to negotiate or transact business on their behalf. Uh, there is what is called durable power of attorney, uh, and then there's limited power of attorney. And uh, you do need to go to have that document notarized. It's best that you talk with someone in the legal uh, field, contact your, uh, say, the neighborhood legal services so that you know that you're uh, defining all the things that need to be defined and clarified uh, and, and have the things in place that you need to sign that are giving you permission while that person has capacity because once they uh, lose capacity, then it's very difficult for anyone, even a notary, uh, to notarize that document because now they don't know uh, that person's, uh, there has to be an assessment. So they don't really know if that person has capacity to make that decision or not. Okay, so I should uh, take my loved one and, and get, have this conversation with my loved one and potentially contact an elder care lawyer from a legal aid services. Oftentimes there's a limited fee or, or very low fee or no fee from folk from groups like that, unless you have money and you can go hire your own attorney. So I need to consider having a conversation where we put a document together that gives me the power to help make decisions for them financially, as mm -hmm. well as if the, again, if they don't have a power of attorney for, for their physical self or for health, that's the same, the same time, they might be looking at power of attorney for both sides, correct? Right, and then, and then they could also uh, contact, if the person, as you say, they have capacity, they can contact these agencies like the utility company, the bank, the credit union, and say that uh, I'm coming in, I wanna make an appointment, this is, a, or send a letter, saying that they want to have this person take care of their business, transact business for them. And then they have that documentation in place and then they go and uh, sign it or, have, or send a letter, have it notarized and send it. So therefore they know that that person's name is put on that account or that signature card for them to assist them in that. And let me just say that from my experience, when it comes to the bank, I'm not sure that it's putting a second person on the person's account is the wisest way to do it because there's a lot of potential issues and I think we need to talk them to talk to an attorney before they make that decision. Because at the point at which my understanding, and you can correct me, um, is that once my loved one places my name on that account, I have as much right to that money as they do. Which also means if I'm not an honest person, and I think to be fiduciary, we need to start with that. That means to be You're someone correct. elected who's honest. Mm -hmm. We need to start right there. Uh, but it's amazing right. people who start out honest and then they, Become something happens, honest. they go yes. crazy or something when yes. they see you have $2. True. Yes. So I would advise people, to, if you're going to add someone to your account, 
talk to the, make sure that's the person you want to have. But secondly, talk, because I think there's another way to do it where you don't have to add their name. Because also liability that I have on my, Paula Duran, if I sign someone, on, just to sign someone's the name and get them a card, my the things that are mine could also affect their credit credit issues. That's so true. And and if and if they become uh, say into some type of legality, then they can take your funds for that per you know to for that compensate for that person. So that you're very correct. Yeah. So let me just reinforce um, that you can go to utilities and look at utilities. Uh, get names for it so that you can transact their business, but I pr I would prefer you to consult someone legal about all of that because I don't know the, the ramifications. If I sign someone to 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 do manage my electricity, if I stop paying, are they now liable? I don't know the answer to that, but a new a lawyer, an elder care lawyer, would know the answer. Yes, and and you're correct, and that that is really who they should go to. But as you as we stated. Some people are not trusting of the system. Some people yes. don't have the funds, but they do need to know that there are resources in place to assist yes. them in that, in that arena. So you're very correct. So let me, let's, we yeah. talked about power of attorney. What other documents do you think are necessary for us to consider putting in place? Well, uh, people should always have a will, even though a lot of times people think that they have nothing uh, but it's important for them to even write things out and have it notarized because what it does do, uh, it helps to relieve a lot of pressure and stress and conflict of what that person's intentions are uh, and how they want things to be should they become incapacitated or die. And so uh, that takes a lot of grief and uh, pressure off of the person who is left with that responsibility. And it also brings clarity that this is what the person wanted, even though others may not agree with it, but it is something that they want it to have, that they want it uh, and to respect their wishes. And, and I think that having the proper documentation in place, I can't emphasize that for a whole lot of reasons. Um, being clear, because one of the things I've seen, if a loved one has $2 over their bearing, and they always say, I don't have any money, I don't have anything, you have $2 and a half of a car, somebody's going to fight over it. Yes. And if you can put something in place to stop your family from fighting and lying, I think that that is absolutely essential that you do that. Um, I worked, uh, Tamara, uh, this is one that I thought was fascinating. I worked with a family once, and the dad didn't like his kids. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, he admitted that he didn't like his kids. And he says, I'm not leaving anything on file. I want them to fight. Oh. I didn't want him to do that. That was his decision because I really think that if you could have peace after a loved one passes, that's more important than anything else. Um, that's so true. But you know, but that is when the majority of the conflict comes out is normally the person who's been doing the caregiver, been doing and giving the most. Uh, here come the people who have done the least and now they want to have the, the fight and the conflict and uh, the dissension. And it becomes uh, over. Overwhelming and, 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 and of course, people are grieving at this time, but none, I think, more so than the person who's been the caregiver, the direct person. Right. So it is important. Uh, however, uh, people need to have the conversation while the person is still in their right mind and have capacity. But then again, we have to be realistic that there are some parents that don't trust their children, fearful of having the conversation but they need to have some type of counseling through their area agency or through the uh, neighborhood legal services so that they know that these are things they need to put in place because you can be well today, fall down tomorrow, and now you may have to have someone to help assist you and you don't have these things in place. And uh, it's kind of just like right now with COVID, some people, they are in uh, a coma or they're on a ventilator. They cannot speak or, or act. But yet and still the bills and uh, say responsibilities are still going on. And if you don't have these things in place and it means that it lags or a person could be uh, lose their home, have certain utilities and things cut off or medications. So these are necessary things that need to be put in place. Well, and uh, people need to learn more that even though they may not agree with everything that's in the system, it's necessary. Right. And let me say this, there are three, three immediate resources that we, you and I have just covered. We talked about that you can go to uh, 
neighborhood legal services, which mm -hmm. is typically a, a fee, low fee base, if fee at all. You can go to the Detroit Area of Aging, of which if, if there's, you know, for referrals or support, but also Wayne State University's Institute of Gerontology has a program called the Nest Egg. Right, exactly. It supports through the SAFE program, it provides assistance for free to, yes. to families that are in need of how do you have the conversation? Because as you indicated, most seniors don't want to tell your kids about their money. That's for true. whatever the reason. That is not that's my business and that's not their business, and I don't want them in my business. That's but you true. need to be part of that business so you can handle the business. That's so correct. So yeah. I would welcome if anyone's interested, uh, it's at the Wayne State University Institute of Gerontology. Um, Latoya Hall is the Latoya person Hall. For the yes. safe, mm -hmm. over the SAFE program. And Dr. Lichtenberg has a program online. So a lot of this stuff you can do online to learn about the kinds of well, documents. Well, here, that are here's needed. one of the frustrations, uh, Dr. Durham, is that a lot of seniors are become frustrated with technology. Yes. And so, but they can can still make the call because Latoya, uh, her services, she could come out and help to introduce them to that. So um, a lot of That's seniors don't want to use technology or either they can't afford for the internet services, but that is a very good program for them to use. And then if they are, uh, if they do have um, social workers or case workers, they can assist them with that as well. Correct. So let's talk about the, uh, how you select a fiduciary or how do you select somebody to make them legally responsible for your finances i know that trust is the main characteristic what other things areas would you talk about in terms of selecting a person to help manage your finances or your assets well that's that's a hard one because sometimes it, it's like who you may trust today may not be the person you can trust tomorrow as Absolutely. you stated, you know, sometimes when people see what people have, uh, they may want to put their fingers in the pot, get a little sticky. Uh, you know, trust is a huge, it's a huge arena. And sometimes you don't know if a person has a gambling addiction, a spending addiction, uh, any type of addiction that may cause them to cross the line and start misusing that person's funds. So that is a very hard um, that's a hard decision because even people who have been uh, appointed as guardians and payees or conservators have, uh, let's say, taken advantage of and exploited uh, seniors uh, financially. So um, I really don't have an answer for that. Other and I think that's that fair. I think that's fair. But I think that the, the loved one has to make some decision uh, and not just leave it out there. And, and, and there are some ways you can write that up because as long as I am capable, I can continue to make decisions myself and I can change you off of my documents if I choose to. So that's why I said, get some legal help if you can. And Trust here, Go on, I'm sorry. And, and here's another area for people who, even though they may have capacity, when a person becomes arthritic or a person loses their vision, now they're vulnerable. And they need, they need, you know, say to, they need to be able to trust that caregiver is going to take care of those financial responsibilities. But then again, we do have some things that are set up on the uh, through the banks, like you can, uh, again, online or either voice, where you can call in and stay. You know, a lot of people are paying their bills online or through their electronic systems at the banks. But they still sometimes they cannot do the reconciliation of checking to make sure everything has been paid in a timely manner and uh, what type of uh, funds they have remaining. So there, there's still areas that we need to be able to uh, bridge the gaps and, and close the communication gaps between the financial institutions and the seniors so that they are getting their reconciliation statements uh, when they are visually impaired or blind. Okay. And, and I believe in, from the, the many caregivers that I've been blessed to support, I think the majority, and this is Paula's opinion, uh, majority of caregivers are good hearted people trying mm -hmm. to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they don't know some things to do so they make mistakes. So it's not necessarily intentional that I'm going to, I'm just gonna steal every dime from them. I, really, I don't believe that. I think the majority of that 53, 55 million people out there are basically 
trying to do the right thing, looking for knowledge and information, and in order for them to do the work to support the loved one, you know, that they're, they're, they're providing assistance to. Um, what were you going to say? Okay. And, you know, uh, some people, like a lot of people have worked for the auto industry, and, you know, they have a legal service, which is free, that seniors can access through their, uh, they can contact their benefits representative if they work for the UAW uh, and to access them to get, a, uh, let's say, that free legal representation to draw up those documents for them. Or a family or elder law attorney can do that as well because they specialize in that. That's correct. Well, we talked, we talked around the concept of a conservator. What is a conservator? A conservator is a guardian uh, or is a protector that's appointed by a judge or uh, they're appointed by the courts to maintain the financial uh, affairs or the daily affairs of a person. And um, they that goes between like a conservatorship and a power of attorney. But the only difference is a power of attorney is set up uh, prior to a person uh, becoming incapacitated and a conservatorship is when they are uh, incapacitated. And I would, and this is, again, my experience has been that it's important that you pull the documents together yourself with, with some assistance from legal versus having a court make the decision about the conservatorship. Because That's part true. of the issue is it's quite an expensive process to have the court appoint a conservator. And I mean, it's really expensive. So if you well, can- you know, but you know, another thing that's happening just recently, you know, when Dana Nessel was having her, uh, her task force, these listening sessions, uh, there was a person who was a wealthy woman. And uh, unfortunately, her psychiatrist uh, wanted her, they were trying to take her money. Uh, and so uh, they were trying to appoint someone as a conservator over her funds. And she, you know, came to the meeting to, to testify that there was nothing wrong with her, but her psychiatrist and I guess whomever else uh, were trying to uh, make this false statement so that they could get a hold of her money. So you see, it, it doesn't just happen at the, the grassroots level of the fam right. family member. It can happen even at the high levels of the people who are even professionals as well. Okay. So we have, we, we first we've already, we've said to our caregivers, that one of your roles is, pro is currently probably pr helping with financial assistance uh, in terms of paying bills, um, picking up food, uh, and a lot of caregivers are taking money out of their own pockets to pay yes. for that. Yes. But if the loved one has money, it's important for you to get the documents right and get them corrected so that you can utilize their money most efficiently and again, as long as the loved one ha does have the capacity to make those decisions, those are really their decisions to be made. And it's, so it's important that we're aware of that. And again, once the, in this whole conversation about if they have cognitive decline, there has to be formal assessments done for that to be determined. Because right. even though a loved one on a Monday or at nine, at the nine o'clock at night has the appearance of not having any mental capacity, but on a Tuesday, they have clarity at nine o'clock in the morning and they, everyone would say, no, you're lying. Mom does not have that issue or dad doesn't have that issue. You mm -hmm. have to have some formal assessments and attorney, and typically an attorney working with you to help get those assessments. So has that been your experience? Yes, yes. It, it is good to have an attorney because that's, that's like that third person that, you know, reporting to and, and keeping track of, because one of the things as a, uh, say as a fiduciary, as a caregiver, you need to keep receipts and you need to keep records. And sometimes a lot of people are not skilled or they, this is not common to them as far as that type of money management, keeping track of these documents so that they can support where they have spent the money. And then at the end of the year, having to do a statement to file taxes or whatever right. uh, to show that they have been, you know, uh, a person of integrity in the expenses that they have uh, done is in behalf of the person that they're caregiving for. And I would recommend until they can get the necessary real financial or legal support, do the zip, Ziploc bag strategy. 
in this Ziploc bag is every receipt that I spent money on my loved one that I'm at least writing on there what I paid for for them. And that way you don't have to go looking for receipts at the point at which you actually receive some formal support because they will, you will be held accountable. As well as if they're family members, they, they might not hesitate to say you're stealing and you had nothing to do with stealing. Um, but you, what they wanted to do was be doing what you were doing. So I'd say start your Ziploc strategy until you can get some legal assistance, keeping the documents there, uh, keeping the receipts there because you have to be accountable for the monies that you spend. Get the legal pieces in place. If the loved one does not have uh, a will, does not have, you don't have guardianship, those are documents that you need to talk to a professional about to try and get those in place. All right, let's assume now, uh, Tamara, we have those in place and we're doing the things we're supposed to do. What concerns or what, what things tend to, your experience, what things worry caregivers as they go through this process? Do you, does that make sense? Yes, uh, what things worry them is, well, let's say the oh, it becomes overwhelming. Some people, uh, will, I have recently met some people that said if they knew this, they would have never signed on to be a power of attorney or to be, because it, it can be very frustrating. It's a lot of work to do. Uh, but then again, that's where sometimes you, you have to, prayer comes in and you have to pray for more strength and grace. And then sometimes you need a team because in the uh, daily uh, comings and goings, like say the grocery shopping, maybe the clothes, the, the uh, social outings, uh, there are a lot of things that need to be put in place that can help uh, the caregiver as far as even as like say having an address book so that you know uh, who to contact or so that the person uh, can set up a team to have them contact the senior so that they're having some type, some type of social engagement or connection. So there's a lot of things that have to happen up front that a lot of times the caregiver is so busy thinking about that they don't do uh, that they need help in doing to organize these things so it makes it easier for them and the person. Even taking, uh, because a lot of times people they inherit being becoming a caregiver. It's not something they ask for. Many people inherit it. And when you inherit it, it, it makes a difference if you, you're already working, if you already have a family. Well, you're breaking up a little bit. And so I will, I will connect to this point that in the early stages, and so because what we started talking then, about was um, being the financial. And again, there are a lot of resources there to help. Um, what we started talking I about was, uh, uh, Tamara, I apologize. I'm talking over you. We're talking over each other a little bit because of the sound quality. That's okay. I uh, wanted to just say mm -hmm. that um, it's important that let's step backwards a little bit because becoming a caregiver, if it's inherited, if you volunteer, if your heart was there, you need to, first of all, truly accept that I am a caregiver because most caregivers don't claim to be caregivers. Oh, I'm just helping out. Or I just get the food every Wednesday or I just do this. I take stuff to the bank. I do this. And when you think about it, they are caregivers and not labeling themselves. Uh, that's a label that right. we have to accept that I am a caregiver. And these are some of the things as a caregiver I am responsible for. And be very clear about that because you need to understand who is the person I'm serving or caring for, what are their needs, and how do we put a care team around them? Exactly. Because one of the biggest complaints of caregivers is that there's too much and I'm alone. And matter of fact, my sibling won't help and, or, my, or someone won't help me. Um, and I wonder sometimes maybe it's better off if they don't help, then you can make decisions yourself. But that's my personal bias showing through. Um, but I think it's important as a caregiver that you make some decisions up front. That way you could start thinking about uh, how do I manage this downstream? Because if caregiving doesn't necessarily start today and end tomorrow. You may be signing up for the long term and being able to anticipate. And if there's disease, some kind of disease the loved one's dealing with, I need to understand the disease, the stages of that disease, how to anticipate needs. So my care team should be inclusive of the physicians and everybody else that needs us to be part of it. Um, that has helped me in supporting caregivers is helping them set up the process up front. And what you're saying is so true because as a care, I've been a caregiver for several people and 
I am so blessed because you do need a team and you need a team of people that you can trust and that people that they, they don't look at it as it's a job, they look at it as it's a ministry mm -hmm. and that they want to help and they're there to help you because uh, as a caregiver, you need that type of support. Right. And you need people you can trust and people who are going to be reliable uh, because that reduces the stress level for everyone and it, and it keeps everyone in a state of, let's say, happiness, right. you know, or, or joy, peaceful. Well, in addition to the list of things you said, I think a caregiver has to, or people in that caregiving team have to be effective communicators. That's true. Because one of the complaints that I hear about caregivers is they behave like, I'm trying to help, right? I'm just trying to help and offer assistance. And the caregiver is like, you're not doing it right. I tell my caregivers, nobody can do it like you, but you still have to figure out how to let other people help. Because, you know, we think, and we are, we're the best caregivers that there are, but we need some time ourselves. We need support from other people. And you have to allow people to give the gifts that they know how to give. Well, you know, another thing I think of also, Dr. Dorman, I'll, I'll say this is that, I think there needs to be a caregiver crisis line because in the, in the late hours of the evening, sometimes caregivers need to vent, they need to cry, yes. they need to be consoled and comforted. And sometimes they, having a crisis line, uh, this helps them to see that, you know, because, and the reason I say this is because some people are dual caregivers. And uh, that's a huge responsibility. And when you're dual caregivers for two people that are, say, both disabled, we don't have a lot of resources out there to assist them in those midnight hours. And as a caregiver, that caregiver needs to be, uh, to be validated and come, have a place where they can feel supported and comfort during their, their moments of, let's say, uh, stress or just exhaustion? Well, and there are some lines out there. Um, they're probably not enough or they're not advertised enough. Um, mm -hmm. I cared for both of my parents at the same time. Mom had Alzheimer's and dad had vascular dementia. So I am one of those caregivers, but I also set up a team. I knew good and well, I couldn't do that by myself, but I had a team of people that were working with us. Uh, but many caregivers are, this is just one person. Yeah. in that house by themselves and so i'm that, that's how universal dementia caregivers became, came about okay. we decided that there was not enough support out there to help people deal with these issues so we wanted to bring some more realism and some cultural sensitivity to serving uh folks in the area of loving on care loving on our, our loved ones and caring for them but i know the alzheimer's association has an emergency line i think the wayne county uh, there, there, there's numbers. And what I can do is put some of that information online. There are some groups that provide that 24 hour access to somebody just to talk to. Right. And, and you're correct. That's really very important to have a, a trusting person that doesn't spiral with you. Because too many people you, ear. Yes, because too many people are curious and want to hear but then they spiral with you. It's like, oh my yeah. God, is really, that's what's happening? No, really? No, you need a listener who can bring you down, not exactly. lift up your energy and make you even more excited. Yes. Okay, so we've talked about the various roles. We talked about guardians, conservators, powers of attorney, and that we should find some legal assistance, that there are some, some low-income organizations around. I think Lakeshore is also one of those yes. um, legal groups, as well as the Legal Aid Society, it, it's in um, Redford. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's two. And if they want the particulars, I can, again, put those two online. Uh, we referred them to three sources when it comes to connecting with people that can help them have the discussion about finances, help them, because that's a hard conversation to have. So we've identified a few sources for that. Um, what other things should we talk about in terms of the role of someone serving the financial support for a loved one? Well, um, I, I've sent you a, an email, uh, let's say with a PowerPoint that has some uh, information on uh, just say basic, kind of like basic record keeping or bookkeeping to assist okay. caregivers. Um, something I put together when I was a caregiver uh, for a person. And then I was also a dual caregiver 
at one time, but one person living with me, another person living, you know, about three miles away. So, uh, but putting things together uh, so that you are keeping track of, because even during that process, even after they die, there's still work that you have to do to close out their finances, estate and notify, et cetera. So uh, the things that I've used, uh, they became very helpful because I had to also um, hire and fire people. Uh, so I had to put in like a, an application, a grievance procedure, uh, you know, a payroll, how am I paying this person? How am I documenting the, you know, expenses, et cetera. So these are things that are in this uh, caregiver and fiduciary and also uh, putting in some, in some videos, uh, clips so that people can see them because a lot of times people, uh, they do watch television, they may watch some YouTube. So there's uh, a lot of different uh, videos and movies made available to help people to see uh, how, say, uh, financial exploitation can hide in plain sight and the things that they need to do to ensure that that doesn't happen. And then also to contact all the different resources and agencies that we have available so that they become more better informed and to reduce the prevalence of uh, financial exploitation. Okay. One of the things that um, the most recent um, issue that we were, we supported was that I was contacted by the uh, female partner of partner and her male friend has dementia mm -hmm. and, but she's not the caregiver nor is she the financial a family member, his family member was responsible for the financials and taking care of them. But it didn't sound like they were doing a very effective job at offering that support. And so she called us to say, well, what can I do? Because they're not paying the bills, they're not taking care of them, he's not getting paid properly. And I, my, my first response was adult protective services if it's that serious, because I think that it's our job to protect. Uh, my exactly. thing is, I say it this way, I don't mean it, old people and babies. We need to take care of both ends of the spectrum and the rest of us in the middle will figure our way out of it. Right. Um, so as we talked with her, when we gave her that, we also referred her to uh, the Detroit Area Aging to see if there are any services that they might provide. We made a recommendation about an attorney that could provide some assistance, uh, but that I didn't want that what felt like abuse or neglect to be a problem long-term for for the gentleman who was not being cared for properly. So someone well, had his money, but they were not taking care of them. Well, when they're not taking care of, when they're not paying the bills and taking care of those needs, that is abuse. That is uh, one of the uh, categories of, uh, or say the characteristics of financial exploitation or abuse. Because that means you're neglecting to take care of that money is for that person. And it needs to be done in a timely manner. And when it's not done, then you're, that's neglecting to do that. So therefore adult protective services should be contacted. And uh, if that person, let's say, uh, and one of the problems is sometimes people don't wanna prosecute. So therefore, as you mentioned, Lakeshore uh, Legal, um, uh, Neighborhood Legal Services Michigan, they do have in place mediation. So people need to come together to have that conversation and uh, they can be made aware of this is your, the fiduciary responsibility and to help them to understand what the, is the expectation and what are the consequences when they don't do this. Yes, so, yeah. um, and I invited uh, the, the, the gentleman who was caring, who had legal responsibility for this gentleman uh, to have a conversation because I wanted to provide some guidance. Uh, they did not contact us, but they did finally contact a couple of organizations. So I feel like some assistance, and I was called later that they were getting some support and assistance. Um, so with that, I think that we could go on and on and on the rest of the day talking about this issue because it's passionate for us. If I were a person having some concerns around this topic and I contacted you, what could I expect? Well, when you contact me, I'm going to listen and then I'm going to give you some uh, resources, give you some definitions, uh, let you know what's available through our agency, our caregiver caregiving, uh, maybe classes you may need to take or reporting to adult protective services 
to make you uh, available, uh, uh, aware of uh, Medicare, Medicaid assistance programs, um, the legal aid and uh, uh, all the different entities that are available and the resources that are there, Wayne State University's uh, uh, older uh, nest egg for uh, adults and the SAFE program. Right. These things are available. So I would be providing you with these resources and those contact numbers uh, and also letting you know uh, that you are the eyes and the ears of the voices of the seniors. Uh, we want elder abuse to be even the, the suspicions of uh, financial or any type of elder abuse to be reported so that we can lessen the prevalence of it. Very good. Let me tell you, thank you. Um, give us your phone number again, please, because right now you're doing everything virtually or on the phone, uh, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the number is 313-446-4444. That's the Detroit Area Agency on Aging. And my extension is extension 5259. Great. And you know that you can always give us a call here at Universal Dementia Caregivers. If we can't assist, we often, we refer because there is a community, there is a community of caring organizations and people that are out there willing, open, and, and hoping that they can provide some assistance to you. You can reach us at 248-509-4357. I'm Dr. Paula Duran. I want to offer my heartfelt thanks to you, Tamara, your gift. Thank you so much for your time. Plus the love that I experience as you talk about working and serving uh, older adults. Thank you for having me. And thank you to your audience for viewing. Thanks a lot. Everybody take care. We'll see you again. I've got a future conversation coming up that you're going to love with Dr. Peter Lichtenberg. It's on the wounded healer. Looking forward to seeing you again.